Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey. Uh, hi, Peter. I'm doing fine. You? Yeah, very good. Thank you for agreeing to do this. It was, I think, about 11 months ago when I first messaged you on the Reddit AMA. And then uh, I've sent a bunch of emails since. Yes. It's been radio it's silence. Quite possible. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. So why now? Why are you happy to do this now? Well, I guess the main reason is because I had to reply to a message specifically uh, on public media. Right, okay. Um, considering the situation of the Mongols bankruptcy, there are two things I need to make sure are known. Which are? Uh, one is about Brock Pierce and his claims on the well, what he's trying to do with Mongols, which I'm not sure of. And the second thing I'm trying to get known about is the CoinLab claim. Okay. Well, while we're here, there's a lot to go through. Yes. And uh, there's a lot of the story I don't know mm. because I came into Bitcoin really whilst it was around 2013, 14. I kind of left and I've missed the whole Mt. Gox thing. But uh, obviously coming back in 2016, it's still a shadow that hangs over Bitcoin. So there's a lot I want yeah. to know about. So whilst I've got you, we'll go into detail. We'll find out as much as we can. So can we start firstly though, can you just try and give me and anyone who would be listening to this or watching this some kind of idea of what the last five years have been like? Well, I, I guess you mean for me. Yeah, uh, sure. So, yeah, the last five years for me have been actually quite uh, busy. So I guess we're starting with the Mongox bankruptcy, which actually happened on February 28th of 2014. And from there, it's been a long year trying to set up things with the trustee. Uh, getting the Japanese police on the case and so on, which uh, actually on January 1st of 2015, the Japanese police announced that they thought it was fully an inside job. Uh, and they would move eight months later on August 1st, 2015 to arrest me. Uh, however, in the meantime, the US police has been working on the case too. Uh, more specifically, the IRS, I believe, was the main uh, entity on work on this and so I was arrested I spent 11 months and a half uh, in detention uh, so during that time I was unable to get any contact with the outside so I not well I followed a little bit of the news of what happened but there's nothing very major happening to me in the meantime uh, however when I was out it was uh, July 14th of 2016 so July 14th actually is French National Day which uh, was a very good day for me because I left the detention center just for the same day terrorist attack to happen in France, which made it not so good day after all. And from there, well, things uh, continue to move with this process in Japan. Uh, the trial start date uh, wasn't set until much, much later, and I believe the trial started uh, on Yes, July 11th of 2016. And so I did my first real day. And a few weeks later, uh, Alexander Vinik, a Russian national, was arrested in Greece. So actually, on my first day of trial, I pled non guilty and I explained that I would continue working on trying to find uh, the red culprit. And we were stole bitcoins from Mongox. So actually, I believe the arrest of Alexander Verdict is a very big step in that direction. Uh, while I was arrested, the Mongols bankruptcy uh, just continued as it would. So, well, creator filed their claims, and everything seems more or less normal. The trial came, went, continued. We go into 2017, the price of Bitcoin starts to rise quite a bit. And we hit the issue with the Mongols bankruptcy, now having more assets, values, and liabilities. And by uh, the time we entered 2018, I believe, things look, uh, well, not so good. There's a lot of news coverage on how whoever owns Mongols would get a billion dollar or whatever. And I did tried to see what I could do to solve this myself too, uh, but it proved to be rather difficult. Uh, however, it was solved in June 2018 when creators filed for civil rehabilitation. And with civil rehabilitation, actually claims are being reevaluated. 
um, depending on what kind of plants will be approved, should be paid as whatever value uh, people were owed, which means we basically solve this issue that came up with bankruptcy. Um, so now the process is in civil rehabilitation, creditors uh, are due to be paid more than they uh, initially supposed to within bankruptcy. There's no story anymore of any kind of surplus or anything. And I believe the bankruptcy is actually on very good track to end either this year or next year, depending on how things go with, well, CoinLab, um, depending on how things go overall. So that's for the bankruptcy and for the arrest actually, uh, I'm due for a verdict uh, one month from now. But that's, uh, I mean, you've told the story there, but yeah. I think I want to know a bit more about yeah. what's it been like for you because Sorry, you've had, yeah. to, well, you've had to deal mm. with the pressure of the world's biggest heist mm. happened under your watch. You've had yeah. death threats. You've had all kinds of accusations mm. of all kinds of crimes. You've had anger towards you. You have spent mm. 11 months in detention pretty much in solitary confinement to a cell, solitary yeah. confinement to a cell with, without the ability to go outside. Um, I'm trying to get a feeling of what it's actually been like for you and yeah. how, how it has impacted you. Well, actually, well, for me personally, the time around the bankruptcy was probably the most stressful part. Uh, before the bankruptcy, we didn't even know exactly uh, what was going to happen. Um, when Mungox went to the court to file, uh, it was, well, we basically expanded all our options. We even tried to approach different uh, VCs on the Bitcoin world to try to see if we could save the exchange. And the conclusion is it was not going to be possible. So at the time, well, there were quite a lot of pressure. Uh, the press was sitting in front of the office for the previous few weeks. A uh, couple of our customers were sitting there too, actually. Um, I even had people not come to the office anymore because I feared for their well, lives. So basically, we filed for the actually civil registration at first. Um, the press conference I gave this day, uh, which you can probably still find a lot of examples of, uh, was very stressful. I mean, I did try to bow and say that I'm sorry in Japanese. At the same time, I completely missed uh, my words. So I did again after, but I basically I didn't, well, it was my first time doing a press conference uh, around Mongox, and it was to announce Mongox civil irritation uh, and announcing that Bitcoin was stolen. So that was not very much of a good experience. And in the following months, of course, uh, I did receive a lot of death threats, a uh, lot of angry messages from many people. Uh, and I lost basically any ounce of credibility I had uh, while running Mongox, or even just as uh, any kind of individual. Uh, yet, aside from Mongox, there was still Mongox parent company, Tiban, which was not bankrupt yet at the time, uh, which I tried to uh, keep alive since we did have customers and things going on. Uh, it did more or less for a few months. Actually, the next year, Tiban, uh, well, Mongox files for Tiban bankruptcy. So I did my best to try to keep employees uh, with a job. So yeah, that was quite a lot of stress too, dealing with the bankruptcy with this at the same time. And after that, well, I didn't really know what to do with myself anymore, mostly because uh, Mongox had kept me very busy. I would spend more than eight hours a day in different kind of meetings with banks, lawyers, and well, all sorts of people. So when Mongox and Tiban were both in bankruptcy, I tried to find something new to start, uh, despite my situation, which actually proved to be quite difficult. Uh, it's actually in that situation that I was arrested uh, in August of 2015. So the arrest was quite a surprise too. Well, not exactly a surprise because it was leaked in the press a few days before, but the news of it was a bit of a surprise. So 
well, when the police came, I just followed them. From there, I went into being interrogated daily uh, for, I guess, one month and a half at first. Uh, then charges were pressed. Um, well, actually, at first, I was uh, detained in the police station in near Shibuya. It's called the Mansebashi Police Station. Uh, so the first days of interrogation were eight days of interrogation, uh, eight hours, sorry, of interrogation and just sleep. Um, after one month and a half, when we, this stopped actually, uh, I went from being busy all day to not having anything to do. Um, actually, that was, uh, I don't know exactly how to say this actually. Uh, I mean, I don't have words to explain this. But when a few weeks later I was re-arrested and interrogation, well, daily interrogation started again, I was almost grateful to have something to do again. Uh, except this only lasted for like 20 days. Uh, then I was back uh, in detention with nothing to do all day. Um, the thing is at this kind of point in time, I, so I was in detention, uh, but I didn't know how long this would take. I had no planned uh, court appearance date. And I was just in detention and just waiting for something somewhere to happen. So this was uh, actually quite, I don't know, been stressful or I don't even know if it's the right word for this. Yeah. So um, actually I spent time in the police station until December 16th, where I was moved to the Tokyo Detention Center, where I was moved from, actually the police station has not many cells, so you're always with some someone, uh, but the detention center had, uh, well, I was put in the cell alone, and I would spend uh, seven months there. So I started basically to get used to this. I made sure to get books, and pens and things for writing, so I could do something with my time, uh, but still spending every day just reading or writing is kind of difficult, especially when, well, you cannot meet anyone. Does it affect your mental state? Uh, I would say so. Uh, after this, when I was finally released on bail, I actually had quite a lot of trouble to uh, adapt back to the outside life, basically. Okay. Um, well, there are some things that didn't bring bad memories at some times. Uh, okay. Well, let's unpack some of the story. Yeah. There's a lot to go through. Yeah, sorry. It's fine. There's a lot to go through. I've got a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, I am going to want to go back to the point where you start to talk to Jed. Yeah. You start to discuss the takeover of Mount Gox. Can you talk me through how that started, how the discussion started, and what the arrangement was between the two yeah. of you? Well, uh, so actually... When I started to get involved with Bitcoin, it was around 2010. Uh, I believe I was the first company actually to accept payments in Bitcoins because most people out there were not exactly companies. Uh, I was acting as a, a very small entity, but still a company. And I started accepting Bitcoins uh, for web hosting and uh, domain name registration. And I started getting involved with the community. And some people, well, so I could help technically, so they came for me for some kind of help. And this actually included Jed, who asked me for some help to uh, set up, like, for example, communication with banks, which provide very complex APIs and kinds of things. So that's how I started to interact with Jed. And in January, I believe, of 2011, he, he mailed me asking me to keep it secret because it could cause a panic, but that he was considering to sell Mongox and asked me if I was interested. Uh, to which I replied, that, of course, it's an interesting thing, but I don't have any money to go on. I'm, even if it's a hosting company, it's not like I've got huge budget or anything. Um, actually, I thought it would be it, but a few days later, he came back to me. And we worked at a kind of transfer agreement where I wouldn't pay anything up front, uh, but which would come with a six months, uh, I believe, revenue share and uh, Jed keeping 12% of a new company that would be created to hold Mongox. And the structure of the 
agreement had mm. an indemnity clause in it, right? Uh, I believe so, yes. Right. And what form of, what, how much due diligence did you perform before the arrangement or did you just kind of take it over without thinking about it too much? Well, actually at the time Mongox was well known as the only uh, Bitcoin exchange uh, out there. Um, well, I mean, I've been running a business alone uh, without much uh, budget. So there were no real due diligence except for confirming judge identity. And well, I used Mongox myself, so I knew how it worked. So that's actually what I was about it. Was Mt. Gox insolvent when you took it over? Well, I guess that would depend on your definition of insolvent. Uh, um, actually, I didn't verify the cash assets because those were on Jed's private name. So I couldn't just ask him to send his personal uh, bank account records. Uh, um, however, at the time, Mt. Gox wasn't known to be uh, well, actually in this time there was no real discussion of this kind of issue with exchanges yet. Were you aware of the missing, full missing number of Bitcoin at the time you took over Mt. Gox? Uh, at the time of the signature of the contract, I understood Mt. Gox uh, was missing $50,000 because it was stolen by some, someone from uh, Liberty Reserve. Mm -hmm. Uh, however, Jed assured me that should be it and told me he was quite uh, sure there would be no other issue with this code. What was the plan to recover the 50,000? Well, basically from what Jed said, uh, just running Mongox should recover this, this money uh, soon enough. Okay. Did you have the necessary skills to take over Mongox? That's once again a very deep, well, interesting question. Uh, if it's about skills, about running a Bitcoin exchange, I'm pretty sure nobody had any experience at the time yet. Um, as for well, running a business, I did run or get involved in different kind of business over the year. So I knew quite a few things about that. Uh, on the technical side, I could see Mongox could use quite a bit of help. Uh, actually, the source code that I got from Jed after the transfer was uh, not really usable at it. But well, that's another story, I guess, or for another question. Uh, but yeah, basically in terms of running a regular business or uh, fixing things technically with Mongox, of course, that's something I could do. However, at the time, Bitcoin was not worth as much as we could call this a financial business. Do you think some people look at back at the time of 2000 and let's say 2010 through to 2014 with 2018 eyes and they consider the time you took over Bitcoin, they think about it as a time when Bitcoin is worth thousands of dollars rather than just a few dollars. And do you think that changes people's kind of views and opinions? Uh, actually, yes, I would think looking at Bitcoin and seeing as it was like three thousand dollars today, uh, make people think differently of Bitcoin even at the time. Despite actually, Bitcoin was like thirty cent, I believe, in two thousand ten. Uh, I mean, someone sold a couple of pizza for ten thousand bitcoins. That's a very well known on documented event. And uh, two thousand eleven, Bitcoin actually more or less was around one dollar at the time. So we're not talking about the same kind of scale anymore. If someone deposited like. $1,000 on Mongox, it was huge. So there's very, very big difference of scale, I would say. So the price accelerated quicker than perhaps the infrastructure and the team you had? Uh, yes, actually I would say so. The price and the size of the market, the number of people using or trying to buy or sell Bitcoins uh, accelerated very quickly. Mongox went from 3,000 users in March of 2011 to 60,000 in June when there was uh, the first well-documented uh, hack of Mongox. Um, from there, it only took two years to reach 1 million users.
what kind of team did you have around you or were you doing it all? Uh, when I took over Mongox in March, I was working alone actually. Uh, however, I quickly hired more people. So by June, I actually had four people in the company, uh, which was not enough to deal with the hack. So I actually asked for help. And many people from outside came to help with uh, Mongox, including uh, Roger Ver or uh, well, people from his company and other customers. But you were already fighting daily fires at that point. I think that's what I've heard you say. Yes. Uh, actually, the first three months of Mongox uh, was a lot of me fixing issues with uh, Jets code because the way Mongox was made, uh, there were a lot of very, well, basic mistakes or issues that may happen when you have maybe a handful of customers, uh, what we call, for example, the waste conditions. So if two people placed a buy or sell order at the same time, they could end executing the same orders uh, from the order book. Okay. So to fix this, ideally what would you would do is to have an execution queue and maybe uh, move the whole execution outside of the main process. Uh, but I couldn't change Jets code that much. I just fixed this with basically what we call a lock. So it would maybe make things a bit slower, but it avoid executing multiple orders multiple times. Uh, there were also a lot of rounding errors, so people could end with balances that didn't exactly make sense. Or when orders were executed multiple times, a balance were not updated right, because uh, updates balance were executed before. Well, after reading the balance for someone, they could get free Bitcoin free money or get less money than they should. Uh, what else? Uh, yes, passwords were encrypted with a very, uh, well, non-suitable way for passwords. So just what we call MD5. So that's something I changed to. Uh, probably one of my very first changes to move passwords to something that's uh, slightly better. So yeah, there were a lot of things to fix with Mongox and as people were using the website and more, and more people were using the website, there were more reports of issues. Um, well, the first, very first person I heard actually was to help with the customer support because I couldn't fix things and answer emails at the same time. In hindsight, do you think you probably should have closed Mt. Gox and rewritten it from scratch? Uh, I would say so, actually. Uh, the first, well, seeing how Mongox was at the time, um, the issue there was with the system, I should have most likely not run this as it was. Uh, however, many of the issues were not visible at first, uh, but only when reported from users. So there was no way for me to find all of this unless I spent a lot of time reading through all of the existing code. Okay. Who is responsible for the failure and bankruptcy of Mt. Cox? Well, that's a very wide question. Mm -hmm. uh, the bankruptcy ultimately comes from uh, the successful thief of Bitcoin from Mongox, which as a director I should have seen. Uh, um, I mean, there have been a lot of things to deal with and to look at. So I had to fix issues with banks and different other things. Um, well, I had to make some uh, sorry. I had to make some assumption at the times that turned out to not work exactly the way uh, they should have worked, uh, especially with uh, cold wallets and Bitcoin security. I mean, cold wallets were working fine, but the way Bitcoins were stolen from Mongox uh, worked in a way that happened even before Mongox knew about, well, it was because it's a bit of a complex thing, uh, technically speaking. But basically, the hacker got inside Mongox before I could move all of the system to new servers and managed to steal keys while staying undetected, which were assumed to not have been stolen and were being reused by some customers, which means that whenever they made deposits, the hacker would be able to steal uh, those bitcoins, 
but uh, on the Mongo side, there would appear some, well, some issue could appear, like because of this, if some customers were uh, created more Bitcoin than they should, uh, but of course nobody reported it. So in the end, the call wallet was working well. Uh, most of the system worked as expected, but the location where the safe happened with very small amounts over a long period of time uh, made this very difficult to detect. Um, even after Mongox bankruptcy, when the trustee hard specialists to work on this. Um, the US law enforcement, Japanese law enforcement worked on this. It took, well, yes, to find out exactly why Bitcoins were missing. What was the total number of Bitcoins stolen from the cold wallet? Uh, well, actually they were not stolen from the cold wallet, but from the deposit system. Mm -hmm. And the total amount is believed to be between 500 and 600,000 Bitcoins. Um, and you state that that was hard to detect. Yes, uh, at the time, those Bitcoins were supposed to be moved automatically to the cold wallet. Mm -hmm. So I assume this was working because, well, I checked balance in the system which were growing. Uh, the hot wallet, of course, was not supposed to grow and it wasn't. Um, that was, well, the way things were supposed to be at the time. I guess people would say you should have noticed 500,000 Bitcoins missing from the cold wallet. You should have known the balances. Uh, is that a fair criticism? Well, I cannot deny uh, I should have moved uh, the cold wallet to something better. Uh, the way the cold wallet was made in 2011 was uh, using well technology of the time, which included printing private keys and the well public key uh, equivalent on piece of papers, which uh, were stored in bank safes or in secure locations to make sure that basically no one could look at this. Uh, the issue is just, well, at the time there was no key encryption, it was not standard. Uh, there was no BAP32 that would allow to make like one master seed and easily check how much there was on all the address but just keeping the public key element. Uh, the way things were, we only had, well, this at the time, um, discussion with people at the time where that basically it could be dangerous to keep uh, the public keys around because uh, no matter what kind of random source is used, there could be a way to work it. Uh, and when you find one public key matching a private key you found from the uh, for example, insecure random generator, it's very easy if you get the other keys to just, well, continue running the random generator to find everything. So the main advice at the time was to not keep public keys either, which made very difficult uh, to confirm how much was in the cold wallet. Okay, so who is responsible for the failure of Mt. Gox? Well, of course I say I bear a large part of responsibility. Uh, the way, well, things were at the time, uh, whoever didn't allow things to be done better, except uh, VIP32 was uh, released, I believe, end of 2012 or 2013. So, of course, it was new at the time, so I didn't believe at the time it was a good idea to just switch to new technology without it being more proved by time. Uh, but in insight, I would say it could have been a good idea to make it, the, well, possible to see what's in the call wallet. Uh, the other issue was with the servers themselves, uh, which well actually were inherited from Jed, uh, but I should also have well checked security and <coughs> improved the way uh, things were secure on the servers. So would you say there's a combination of responsibility here from you? There's fault in how you've maybe the lack of full due, due diligence in taking over Mount Gox, mm. um, mistakes you've made. While, while running Mt. Gox, part of the fault lays on the fact that this is new technology. You know, there's still hacks mm. happening today, right? Yeah. Um, you are essentially the guinea pig full guy for original technology. Mm. And then also blame should be placed still with Jed. Is that a fair summary? I would guess so, actually. So, 
I don't think Jed expected at the time to, for the price to go the way it went. Uh, nobody expected at the time. I mean, we had trust in Bitcoin. We believed in Bitcoin, uh, but we never saw Bitcoin going from like ten to thirty dollars uh, back in two thousand eleven, or even reach a thousand dollars in two thousand fourteen. Um, well, for Mongox, it meant dealing with many, many more customers, banking issues. Uh, suddenly, when just some random business, we're very close to financial business, which meant uh, governments uh, approached us or went after us. So the kind of work this meant uh, changed drastically over time. Um, well, as I said before, it was mostly an issue of dealing with uh, fixed things daily. Um, well, I could think today of many ways uh, this could have been done better, uh, but I don't think at the time anyone had any idea of how things would go uh, or what specifically to do to prevent this. One thing is that Mongox actually blocked uh, many, many kind of attacks from different kind of hackers. Um, we improved security, we were often attacked by DDoS attacks. So I actually Mongox went to uh, companies specialized in protecting from these kind of attacks to uh, make sure the website would continue working even under attack. Uh, we went through a lot of things, but I guess uh, at the time, securing and, well, making sure things, well, sorry, making the call wallet auditable uh, was not a priority at the very beginning because of the risk it involved. Um, that's something that could have been changed uh, if we knew about the way, uh, well, if we knew it would have been important. So I guess most people mm. will hear about the reports of the maybe 10 most prominent hacks on Mt. Cox, and they'll look at something like the YSEC report, but probably fail to appreciate maybe that there were, the site was under constant attack, and they don't hear about all the attacks that maybe you thwarted. They only hear of the ones that got through. Yeah. And this is a, I guess it's an industry where anybody who's running any kind of exchange is constantly under attack and you were the first to try and fight back these attacks. So do you think sometimes maybe people don't appreciate that? Oh, well, I guess actually quite a lot of people do not well, appreciate the way things uh, are for exchanges even today with, well, of course, attacks, but also dealing with banks, dealing with financial entities, dealing with governments. Uh, many other exchanges that came up while Mongox existed disappeared before Mongox went into bankruptcy. Uh, some had issues with banks, some were just hacked. Uh, like, for example, one of the first Bitcoin wallet service, which was called My Bitcoin, uh, was completely hacked and disappeared from circulation. Uh, I don't remember if it in 2011 or 12, uh, but uh, there were many, many hacks and basically every single, well, company on internet is targeted uh, daily. And Bitcoin business is even more because there's a much higher, well, profit to be made from it. Uh, but for example, even chat networks uh, are often hacked just to, like for example, someone doesn't like someone else on the chat network, so just get the whole network done to shut them up. or websites. I mean, DDoS attacks are very common on the internet. Sometimes you hear in the news that uh, some hackers managed to put down the FBI website, I think a few years ago. So basically internet is a well, dangerous place because everyone can try and go and attack anyone else. Uh, well, speaking of attacks, by the way, I forgot about one kind, uh, swatting too. Mm -hmm. YouTubers just attacking each other or kind of things. So, yeah, the world is a dangerous place on being an exchange actually puts a big target on one's back, which means that there would be that many more people trying to uh, target this kind of businesses. Have you taken enough responsibility for what's happened? One of the common things I hear from people is that um, you've co tried to defer blame for what happened to other people or to the technology. Do you think you've taken enough responsibility for what happened? 
Well, I don't know actually what enough is. So, and I guess it depends on for each for everyone. Um, my goal is to just not stop doing what I can do as long as there's something I can do. So, when I was running Mongox, I first tried to make sure everything was running smoothly. Obviously, it was not enough. Mongox went to bankruptcy. So I did my best to make sure the bankruptcy would run smoothly and as fast as possible, which was, well, uh, because I cannot control everything, of course. Uh, didn't go as good as it went, could be, but still I spent a lot of time uh, getting in touch with creators and helping them, explaining how to file claims. Uh, I tried to be as available as possible. Uh, um, when we went with the issue of Bitcoin being, well, having more value than would be needed for the bankruptcy, one thing I actually did, which a lot of people didn't like at first, is I, I said, uh, well, people actually asked me if I would get anything, do I pledge it back to the creators? And my reply was usually that, uh, of course, I could do it, uh, I, but it would be much better for Mongox to, well, first of all, switch to civil rehabilitation. Um, that would require effort from the creators. So I'm not going to pledge anything at this point. Please work and try to make this a civil rehabilitation. Um, I guess not everyone liked it, uh, but considering that if I was to pledge anything, it would mean that funds went from Mongox to Tiban and to me. Uh, a lot of people would get uh, their hands on it first. A lot of it would go into taxes because in Japan, uh, payments from shares you own uh, is taxed like a bill of 30%. Um, of course, even if it came to me, a lot of people would assume me to try to get their hand on this first. So it would be just an unending battle and nobody would profit from it. So rather than just having people feel safe and not do anything, I, my idea was to tell them to act. Okay. Well, we'll come, we'll come back yeah. to that. Okay. Sifting through the various hacks and trying to understand the timeline yeah. from yeah, 2011 through to mm. 2014, it seems to me that you inherited a broken system with a debt. And it seemed to me that that hole, which the debt was based around, kept digging and digging and getting bigger and bigger. And it feels like you were fighting fires and chasing your tail and trying to recover losses. And p perhaps one of the things that worked against you is not at any point just coming clean and saying, we've got a problem here. It's almost like the problem, mm. the more you try to fix the problem, the more it escalated. Is that a mm. fair assessment? Uh, I would guess so. Um, actually, there are reasons for things going this way. So first about, well, the way Mongox was when I, well, took over Mongox, of course, there was this issue with $50,000 missing. There was another 80,000 Bitcoin missing, mm -hmm. which uh, Jed told me one morning on Skype. Was that the, did that go missing during the handover period? Uh, actually, it went missing at the, mostly at the end of the handover period. Uh, around the same time Jed sent me the password to the server. Yes. So what do you think happened there? Well, that's difficult to say because uh, we'd have need to run a more proper forensic investigation on the server. Uh, but what was clearly visible is that someone managed to transfer 80,000 bitcoins uh, from the bitcoin client running on the Mongox server to an outside address. Um, They've never moved, have they? Hmm? They're still at that address. Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Uh, it's an address starting with one F-E-E-X something. What is the value of those Bitcoin at the time? Well, it was more, well, slightly less than $8,000 actually. Okay. Because Bitcoin was like, I believe, like 0 0.95 or something. But if those Bitcoins aren't recovered and the value mm. goes up, it becomes a bigger problem yeah. to solve. Indeed. And so those 80,000 Bitcoin go missing during the handover and Jed's response is, this is your problem now, Mark? Well, actually, more or less, I tried to ask him how to handle this or what we could do, but because I already signed a contract with him and there was a full indemnification for any kind of issues, 
I couldn't really bring this up anywhere. So my best shot at this was just to listen to his advice, or at least that's what I believed at the time. Um, so he gave me, well, he sent me an email where basically there were three uh, options to go with this. Uh, one was just to hope and wait. One was to try to get uh, an investor in. And actually at the time he sent me, uh, for example, he asked me some, give me a name, uh, but actually a company based in uh, the Cayman or somewhere. Well, it didn't really sound uh, good idea to just get some random company inside on. And the third option was actually to uh, transfer the uh, new Bitcoin debt into US dollar debt by just trading it over. So that basically the mail he sent me. Okay. So over time, there's a number of hacks, different kinds of problems on the system. The, yeah. I guess the debt of the Bitcoin to the company is growing. Are you starting to worry at any point thinking how do I, because essentially you're operating a fractional reserve at that point. Are you starting to worry at all, thinking you'll never be able to recover this? Are you worried that the price is going to go so high that you're in a position where you can't pay all the creditors? Are you starting to worry whilst operating the exchange? Well, actually I would say I was worried starting day one. Right. Uh, because it's a very big thing to take over. Um, Suddenly, there's like 80,000 bitcoins missing on top of the $50,000. So it's not, well, was it much of a difference at the time uh, until Bitcoin went to $30 and it was much more of an issue. Uh, and, well, basically, everything that happened during running Mongox uh, from banks closing Mongox bank accounts, uh, Government trying to stop Mongols from operating and so on was a source of worry and things. I tried to address my with the best of my abilities and as fast as I could. How much can you talk about Willybot? Well, unfortunately, it's part of an ongoing trial right now in Japan, so I'm afraid I cannot reply to this. Okay. So the debt's growing. You're obviously getting worried. Is well, there any part, is there anyone, anyone else in the business aware of the full extent of the missing Bitcoin or is this something you've just kept to yourself and kept away from everybody else? Well, uh, actually I made sure I would be the only one knowing about this. Okay. Uh, mostly because I believe it was my responsibility as someone who took over Mongox at the time. Um, just was my, well, my job to get this cleared. Um, well, actually, based on the calculation I made at the time, the debt should have been gone by 2013. Mm -hmm. Based on trading fees and buying Bitcoin back? Basically. And maybe something else we can't talk about, but yeah. okay. But that didn't happen, right? Well, that didn't happen because in 2014, uh, when uh, someone who actually used to run Android Exchange uh, came to the Mongox chat and explained that it was possible to steal Bitcoin from Mongox with uh, transaction malleability. Uh, this prompted Mongox to stop allowing transfers and to go through a full audit of all Bitcoin including Cold Wallet where it became clear because we're missing. So that was the time you first became aware? Yes. So, so at the time mm. of the audit, Yeah you were still short, you were aware that you were short an amount of Bitcoin. You hadn't recovered all the lost Bitcoin up until that date. So how short were, were you in terms well, of Bitcoin at that date? Actually, in terms of calculation at that date, uh, considering all, well, Mongox made about 200,000 Bitcoins so far, mm -hmm. and we knew about uh, less than 100,000 missing. So there should have been actually more, more Bitcoins. Right, so you, you, at that point you believe you had a surplus yes. without realising your own Bitcoin had already been stolen. Yes. So you, you start the audit and mm. talk me through the process of the audit and what you start to discover and mm. what you start to feel. Well, uh, basically there was different parts of the audit because Mongox over time had accumulated many kind of different kind of cold wallets. 
uh, but the my main part is actually paper based, which involved uh, to check, uh, well, being in a secure environment and scanning private keys, uh, which I believe there were probably something like 200 to 300 sheets of paper at the time. So, job of basically scanning and checking on uh, the blockchain how much there is. For this purpose, actually, I made a specific piece of software, which just from the private key generates a public key, and um, well, look it up. So checking all the code actually took some time, uh, mostly because I had so I had to be at the office and deal with many other things. Uh, at the same time, we also made uh, something to work around the transaction malleability, which is actually called the uh, well, we basically created a new transaction hash that wouldn't be affected by transaction malleability with the help of a Bitcoin core developer. So it took, I believe, about a week to go through all of the cold wallets on, well, actually not all of the cold wallets, most of the cold wallets on, conclude there were not enough Bitcoins to continue. Um, from that point, uh, Mongox started to discuss with the court uh, going into bankruptcy or civil rehabilitation. And at the same time, we approached big names in the Bitcoin world to see if there was any way to well, save Mongox at this point. So at first, there was a belief of uh, around 750,000 customer Bitcoins missing yeah. and 100,000 Mt. Gox Bitcoin. Um, but did you realize all was gone at the same time or were you just like checking wallets and realizing over time like, oh, there's some... Explain to me how this actually happened. Well, as I say, it takes some time to uh, scan all of the wallets. However, well, as I run through the addresses and find only small amounts or no amounts, well, I started to come into, well, really realizing that things were looking very bad. Um, actually, nearing the end, I was afraid to even scan addresses. Like, not knowing would be better than knowing that there was bad news. Would you say that mm. probably is a reflection of sometimes maybe how you ran the business as well? Would it be fair to say perhaps you ran away from problems or kind of kicked the problem down the road and moved on to the next problem? Well, for Mongox, I wouldn't say so because most of the issues outside of the, well, missing Bitcoins initially coming in, uh, we, well, take all this head on and, well, fix most of the issues out there. Or even the US seizure of $5 million from Mongox was about to be uh, solved by the time Mongox went into bankruptcy. Okay. Hmm. So you realize 850,000 Bitcoin are missing? Yes. Half a, about half a billion dollars. It's the world's biggest heist. Yeah. Well, at the time I was not thinking about if it was the world's biggest or not. Uh, um, really, I wasn't sure what to think or what to do, um, with the help of Mongox lawyers at the time. Well, but Mongox went into the civil rehabilitation filing. Uh, from there, we went on to, uh, well, re well, taking some time to reanalyze everything. Do you think mm. during the time when it was happened, you were being honest enough with customers or had you had a panic and didn't know what to do? Talk me through the time when you've discovered Bitcoins are missing and you're putting messages on the website or you're... Well, how, how, what, what's your hmm. kind of thought process during that time? What did you do right? What did you do wrong? Actually, the main thing that happened at the time when we first saw the issue with the, uh, well, transition liability, we discussed with our lawyers who advised to go through the full audit and not disclose anything at the time. Okay. So we did explain, we found about the transfer liability, we explained why uh, Mongox stopped transfers uh, and what steps were taking to solve this, which uh, means solving technically speaking and making sure the system would be safe before it's restarted. Uh, but in the meantime, during the audit as well become were found to be missing, uh, the, we approached the court and the initial advice from the court was to continue running the business as usual 
until on the I believe 24th, the court asked us to just uh, stop the, the website. Um, so it just became a blank page at the time. And from there, it was only a few days until the bankruptcy was announced. And then all chaos ensues. Yes. So if you look back on the period of 2011 to 2014, what, and you, if you're really honest and fair with yourself, what are the fairest criticisms you can put in yourself and what should you have done differently? Well, I guess the way bit, well, missing Bitcoin were dealt with was the biggest issue of there. Uh, well, the biggest issue that caused, well, not that caused, but that remains uh, to be discussed. Uh, at the time, so bitcoins and dollars were missing. Um, well, the only advice I had at the time was from Jed, which was to basically try to do something to solve the situation over time, uh, but not make any kind of well, waves or anything because it could disrupt the market. Um, Afterward, when we saw, for example, when Bitfinex was hacked and the issuance of tokens to just replace whatever was hacked and recover over time, well, it shows that there's actually a much better way to deal with these kind of issues. So, I believe anyway, today it's the most uh, standard procedure for exchanges that get hacked, uh, way of doing things. But at the time, well, I went with whatever I had, which meant trying to get the exchange to continue running, um, well, making profit in order to make sure everything uh, everyone's getting whole again. Okay. Talk, so, yeah. talk me through the Japanese bankruptcy yes. process. Talk me through how it works. Talk me through the process that you've been through. We're taking Mt. Gox through that. Mm. And, um, and then also, can you talk to me about this very strange situation where most companies who go through a bankruptcy don't see their assets inflate by 100 x during that time, which changed the whole dynamic yes. of the situation. Can you talk me through that? When Mongox actually so filed for civil rehabilitation on February 28th of 2014, actually, we didn't have many uh, assets. We had some $30 million uh, worth in cash assets. And, uh, few thousand bitcoins. Uh, one thing that changed things quite a bit is actually a few weeks later we added 200,000 bitcoins uh, to the bankruptcy estate which uh, when Mongox went into bankruptcy on April 24th uh, 2011, uh, 2014 sorry, were part so of the estate and were evaluated at that time so I believe around five hundred dollars a bitcoin. Uh, and, well, bitcoin was worth more or less this kind of amount. Um, Mongox should have have been like four times to five times more bitcoins. So even if the price increased three or fourfold, it would have been fine within the scope of the bankruptcy. Uh, however, by so from there it went on the standard bankruptcy procedure. People made claim, all the claims were of course valued in Japanese yen. Um, regarding the bitcoins, the trustee actually tried to find ways uh, he could distribute bitcoins as bitcoins. So they were not sold uh, at the time. However, in 2017, I believe, or 2018, when bitcoin price uh, went over $2,500, it means that the value of the Mongox estate was higher than the total of all the claims, which actually is not unheard of in bankruptcy. Sometimes uh, companies or individuals have real estate uh, that ends being sold for three or five times more than the estimated amount. Uh, and actually what happens typically in this kind of case is whatever remains is paid to the individual or the company shareholders because it means they were not actually bankrupt. Uh, but for Mongok's case, it's a slightly more difficult uh, question. Um, the easiest solution for this was just to go back to civil rehabilitation because it would not only make it uh, possible to reevaluate the claims uh, at a well, more accurate value, 
but as well, it would make it easier to distribute bitcoins as bitcoins to creators, which would well pl well please more of the sorry, which would please most of the creators. Could you legally yourself have claimed the surplus from the bankruptcy? Uh, not. Myself, anyway, because I'm not directly well, the owner of Mongox. So, uh, Tiban. Uh, but Tiban, anyway, well, there's no reason to claim it because it's part of the shares. So, whoever owns the shares uh, would have been receiving this kind of surplus. So, there was no claim to file, it just whatever remains at the end of the bankruptcy when all creditors are paid. So, the company is seen as having no debt anymore, uh, is paid back to the owner of the company. So, it could have been paid back to you? could have been paid back to me. However, based on my, well, discussion with the trustee and the court, uh, well, I helped make sure it wouldn't happen. Okay. There's a couple of spanners in the works with the whole process in terms mm. of creditors and things holding things up. Let's talk about, let's talk about those now. So firstly, let's talk about CoinLab and Peter yeah. Vasenas, who is the only person I haven't been able to mm. get hold of during this uh, process of trying to interview various people. Talk me through the CoinLab uh, legal situation, what Peter is claiming and what your thoughts on it are. Well, maybe I should start with the beginning of the story between Peter and Mongox, mm -hmm. uh, which is a story actually that starts in 2010 in uh, Costa Rica where Jed was and where Peter came with him. Uh, to uh, maybe walk or try to do something with Mongox. So I wasn't there, so I don't know exactly how it went. Uh, but after taking over Mongox, I got an email from Peter uh, telling me that he actually owns half of Mongox and should have been paid half of whatever Jed was paid. So I forwarded this to Jed, and Jed responded to Peter and me just saying, what the fuck, uh, <laughs> basically. Uh, after a few exchanges, actually, this well, Peter Vesene stopped sending emails, so I completely forgot about him until uh, in 2012, we, well, Mongox was getting bigger. Um, we saw the situation in the US to be increasingly difficult. Uh, we discussed with three different lawyers and we got three different opinions. So some lawyers thought that being in the US would be fine as long as we're in Japan. Uh, another firm told us we would need an MSB license, so a money service business license. Um, our main lawyer just told us you need an MTB, money transmitter business license, which means uh, having an office in every single state and huge cost. So we saw the cost being 10 to 50 million dollars, which is something we couldn't do. And around the same time, CoinLab approached us and initially actually offered to take over Mongox uh, management which was not really interesting in itself. Uh, but after some discussion offered to just handle the legal situation in the US by uh, representing Mongox and being the Mongox USA uh, front. So of course, since there's any way need to be in the US uh, to do this, it was easier for us to just uh, ask of CoinLab to do this. Um, at first, they seemed to have some interesting ideas on how to deal with that. Uh, so we started drafting a contract, which I believe was signed a few months later in 2013, where, uh, actually no, the contract was signed in 2012, uh, where CoinLab would uh, have, to, of course, to comply with all laws and regulations, um, well, represent Mongox in the US. So the contract was signed, uh, however, all, well, what we saw is that CoinLab didn't seem to be compliant. Uh, by the time we approach, the time where CoinLab, we need to actually uh, go live, the FinCEN uh, published a guidance explaining that Bitcoin exchange were indeed MTB. Um, we need to get the MTB license. So our first thing was to contact CoinLab and to ask them what they thought about this and what was their plan to comply uh, with this. Uh, however, they didn't provide a response to this. Their initial response that, well, licensing is not really required for uh, startups. Um, then, well, the guidance was quite clear on this and all lawyers were not convinced 
but whatever coin lab said um, we offered them to continue working with them and we needed them to provide us a timeline on how they plan to comply and a few months later i don't remember exactly when they just filed a lawsuit against mongox uh, claiming we didn't uh, well we didn't allow them to go live without a license because it was a clear violation of the contract and it was a huge risk for mongox uh, they sued mongox over this we uh, filed a counter uh, counter complaint i believe explaining that not only they didn't uh, comply with the contract but they started doing live customers uh, sending millions of dollars while still in test um, from there the lawsuit moved rather slowly um, by the time mongox went to bankruptcy it was still ongoing so it was stayed by the bankruptcy did you stop peter creating a 16 billion dollar business i don't think so I mean, when CoinLab approached us, they actually failed their first venture, I believe, which was to try to uh, let game companies include the mining software in their games to use the gamer's GPU to make money. Um, I don't think CoinLab ever had an actual business, uh, running business, ever. So what is the status of the... Uh, lawsuit here because it's holding up the distribution to creditors right now yes well the lawsuit right now is stayed which means that it cannot move forward by itself uh, CoinLab initially filed a claim uh, for the lawsuit amount of 75 million dollars uh, plus interest in the Mongox bankruptcy uh, they made a similar claim to the Tiban bankruptcy um, well, their claim, of course, was rejected by the trustees. So they uh, made a petition for assessment, which allowed them to uh, ask the court to assess the claim again. Uh, however, the petition for assessment uh, was then over by the time Mongox went into civil rehabilitation again. So right now they filed a claim again, uh, around $16 billion claim, which was rejected again, and they've got until March uh, 7th, I believe, to file or not file a petition for assessment. So that's about a similar time to your own next steps for your own legal position, right? Yes. So March is a big month. Um, yes, March 7th is the deadline for filing a uh, petition of assessment for Green Lab. And the deadline, well, there's the verdict for me on the 15, and there is the creditors meeting on the 20. Right, okay. Uh, Brock Pierce, I obviously spoke with Brock last week and I guess from my position I can't fully get to the bottom of what his incentives are or his motivation is. Um, it seems to change depending on which interview I read or watch and it changed during the time I spoke to him. Can you give me a background to the Brock situation because there was a time where you did make an agreement with him so can you give me the background where we are now with Brock and what your own personal opinion is on what's going on here. Yes. Well, one thing I'm going to correct is we actually don't have an agreement with Brock, uh, just a letter of uh, intention we received from yes. him. Yes. He seems uh, to think, though, that is yes. a uh, legally binding uh, an agreement. And I'll tell yes. you what he said to me. His view was in the fire sale of a business where something's going crazy and he's stepping in to help you. He said, you don't always have a full legal contract. Sometimes you operate with a very limited uh, uh, letter of intention. And he said he spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands at the time on PR and press and uh, getting people in to help fix uh, the situation with Mount Gox. So how much of that is true? Well, uh, so I... Go back to the background with Brock Pierce, actually. Since he approached Mongox back in uh, late 2013 to early 2014 about uh, expanding Mongox's business to China, explaining he had a lot of contacts with China and mm -hmm. could, well, make Mongox work very well over there. Uh, when Mongox went to bankruptcy, he approached us again and offering to uh, take over the bankruptcy and, well, basically making uh, Mongox a better 
give, get a good ending, uh, basically. So the first step to this was, of course, uh, to try to buy the Mangox shares. Um, of course, it will need the approval from the Tokyo District Court and different other things. So the first thing we came with was the letter of intention, where he explains the situation. And basically, there are two, well, I believe there are different uh, important things on this, uh, but the two last paragraphs of the letter of intention uh, are usually the ones I mentioned in this kind of uh, talks because the one before last is about getting the approval of the Tokyo District Court uh, for the transfer of the shares, which uh, actually we offered uh, Brock to uh, do for him, but he didn't reply uh, on this. So at this point, I do not, well, I never saw the approval of the Tokyo District Court. And the last one was within 45 days of the LOI to uh, negotiate and enter an agreement for the actual transfer of the shares, which didn't happen either. So the last communication we had on this is, well, initially we wanted to work with Brock uh, and signed his LOI, sent it to our lawyers too. Uh, our lawyers told us that this would have to go through the Tokyo District Court first. So the process would have been to, uh, it was on a Friday, but to rescind the LOI, send it to the Tokyo District Court. We talked initially to the Tokyo District Court and they told us they would be able to give the approval uh, by Monday, uh, then sign it again by date Monday. Uh, and I, the person representing Broke Pierce at the time told us, so yes, no problem, we're going to get you this back to you. Uh, however, I didn't get any reply after that. So the recession letter for the uh, LOI was never signed by Brock and we never were able to talk to the district court about uh, getting this approved. So there's a period of silence after that? Yes. And then when does Brock come back into the picture? Well, the first time I saw him coming back into uh, the Mongox story was with the appearance of GoxCorp, which was a entity uh, which made some kind of PR in some news site and made a very lavish uh, party for the Bitcoin 10 years with a big golden Gox letters on the cake and, uh, well, ladies blowing the candles and stuff like this. So that completely kind of feels foreign to me, uh, but Part of the people who were there and were shown on the videos includes uh, Brock Pierce. And from there, I didn't, well, he spoke about this and there were some uh, videos of him talking on uh, Twitter too, I believe. Uh, but this didn't really take. I think most people didn't really uh, feel about the lavish party that was put around this. Uh, a couple of months ago, then Gox Rising was created with, uh, once again, Brock Pierce appearing and doing a talk about how uh, Mongox can just rise back from the ashes and everything. And I guess that's when he really came back in the picture and, well, claimed he could uh, revive Mongox. I first met Brock in Las Vegas. I was there for World CryptoCon. I was invited to a meeting to announce um, new action by some of the creditors. Mm -hmm. So it was in a hotel room in Aria. I got up there and it was a DJ, cocktail bar, uh, booth babes with Bitcoin signs on. A uh, very strange situation then that Brock came in. Yeah. So it probably sounds similar to the yeah, I, the one you had. Yes, that would be the Gox Corp event, uh, which was uh, managed, I believe, by some lawyer called uh, Oliver Wright, I believe. Yes who's based out of Los Angeles. Yes. Yeah. Um, actually, he contacted me on Twitter at some point too, asking about uh, 35,000 Bitcoin creditor, uh, which I didn't know about. So it took some time and digging at the Tokyo District Court to find out who it was. Uh, but I believe it's about a person called Roman Hosaim. Mm -hmm. uh, I found one press release about this also on the internet. Um, actually looked at this claim, but I 
couldn't confirm it because uh, it lists a different number of Mongox accounts with login names. Uh, none of those actually exist uh, except the first one. Right. Okay, so back to Brock. Brock mm. said to me his objectives were based around his love of Bitcoin. Mm. He loves Bitcoin. He feels the story of Mt. Gox has harmed it. He feels like a better story can be told about Mt. Gox and wants to revive it. So that's his uh, goal one. And his second goal was quite direct. He said he wants to make sure that Mark Carpalis doesn't get any of the money out of the Mt. Gox uh, uh, liquidation and civil rehabilitation. So how do you feel about both of his goals? Well, actually, when Bro came to me, his first discussion was about how he could help me uh, improve my well, personal image and make Mongox a better story. Um, well, reading a little bit about it, I saw he wanted to do different things, uh, relaunch Mongox, uh, issue shares as an ICO. So he explained actually to me that he already done this before, ICOs are securities, so it's fine, he got the experience to do it. Um, of course, he didn't tell me anything about uh, trying to make sure I didn't get anything. Um, I didn't raise the question because at this point you know, I wasn't planning on getting anything. So that's one subject that wasn't talked about. Uh, however, well, based on what he said to me, actually he came in this very office and we talked. Uh, um, we talked about CoinLab too. He ex told me he could probably get CoinLab to back down. He was not very friendly with Peter. Uh, he, he actually got Peter Vesnes out of the Bitcoin Foundation and told me a few things about this. And well, since we didn't know yet who was a big creditor in the Mongoose bankruptcy, well, I had a very good idea it was most likely a coin lab, uh, but I wasn't sure they actually made a $16 billion claim that sounded maybe too much even for Peter. So I thought maybe I can go to the court and confirm and I can tell you if it was Peter or not. So this, we just left this office, went to the court. Uh, I asked him actually to wait outside because only creators or people related to the bankruptcy can go inside. Um, I, well, it took up more than one or maybe two hours to get the documents, but I could confirm at the time that uh, kind of did indeed make a $16 billion claim. So I just came out, uh, told him. Um, we just took a little bit more and just parted ways. But then the next day, or maybe a few days later, I saw an article in a uh, Bitcoin news website where Brock Pierce uh, was saying like he could revive Mongox on how I was a bad guy and everything. And that was quite different from his initial story. So I didn't really trust, uh, well, I didn't really trust him much to begin with, but that basically gave me the clear cut of, well, I think what he's saying directly to me and what he's actually saying outside being completely different and from there it turned out that way more than just this story about what it was saying uh, was false so of course there's this claim of owning mongox which uh, when he made it i immediately replied on twitter because someone asked me to confirm is it true i told him no i mean we did have a loi at some point that was on a lot of conditions of getting approval from the court and negotiating getting an agreement done, but this never went further than that. Um, well, there's actually so many things in this, like he initially wanted to file a new CR plan, and then he says he's not going to file a CR plan, but this website still says he's going to file a CR plan. Uh, I, there's no way to know exactly what he really wants to do anymore. I'm not sure either. I would guess the ICO would be a goal that would bring of course, uh, a lot of image and money in. So that sounds like the most, well, uh, credible part of everything as far as what he told me about what he wants to do and what I see in the media. Uh, but for the rest, I'm actually really not sure. So what I don't understand is, obviously I wasn't aware he mm. had come here and had a meeting with you. And, you know, hearing you explain that now, I'm trying mm. to understand what, how he's gone from talking to you about wanting to revive Mt. Gox and help you with your own personal image. A few weeks later, he's in an interview with me showing nothing but hatred towards you and wanting to 
make sure that you don't get any money out of Mt Gox. What's happened in those few weeks, do you think, that's made Brock change in that way? Well, I would guess what made it really change his mind was the way we fought over Twitter. Uh, when he first explained, he, well, he first posted about uh, only Mongox, I replied, no, it's not true. Uh, we had a few exchanges on this. He said something about not wanting to let me get $700 million, which I don't really know where he got this from. I guess maybe from the bankruptcy, but I mean, it's not news anymore and it's not true since middle of 2018. Um, from there, so I just explained to him, no, it's not like this anymore. Uh, went into more of this uh, argument and for him asking me who would be more fit to handle this if I was zero me and I mean, there's no need for this. The trustee is already in charge of this process. And the Tokyo District Court is overseeing all of this and I believe it's the most uh, neutral way to handle this issue rather than having someone just stepping um, maybe with some kind of uh, goals like running an ICO, which obviously would be for profit purpose, I believe. Uh, but yeah, so I don't think anymore, well, there's anything Brock can bring into the bankruptcy. Uh, most of the things I've seen announced he could do uh, were actually things that were already done by other people or are being done right now by other people. So if rewriting Mongo's history I means just seeing everything was, everyone was saved thanks to Brock Pierce, I don't think it's a good thing. Uh, because, well, a lot of people are involved in this, a lot of people lost a lot with Mongox. Many creators are fighting very hard to try to make things, uh, well, to give this whole story a better ending. Um, well, improving Mongox uh, ending is just some scenario writing on uh, going into the news and just pushing a new story. It's actually acting on, well, everything creators have been doing so far, uh, getting Mongols into civil rehabilitation, getting sure they know about what's happening uh, are very important parts of uh, getting Mongols in the right direction and just pushing, well, false information or giving people false hopes uh, is not the way of reaching this uh, conclusion. It seems to me from your AMA and having mm. spoken to you and this, it seems you've been humbled quite a bit by the process um, your intentions now are only good. Um, do you think you're, you've been misjudged and mis or misrepresented? Well, that's something I, when well, responding by myself to this is kind of difficult. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, judge me very harshly, especially right after the bankruptcy. I received, as I said before, a lot of death threats and uh, very unkind messages, uh, but I've been working with creators and with different people to try to get things uh, in the good direction for in the bankruptcy. I did actually have creators thank me for helping them. Um, I believe my actions today are, well, speaking louder than anything I could say. So I'm still anyway going to continue to try to do whatever I can do to make sure uh, the bankruptcy goes in the good direction which uh, means distributing as much as possible of the assets as fast as possible to as many creators as possible. Uh, and well, I would obviously don't have a full control of the situation, uh, but I can still help because I'm in Japan. I can, well, I know what's happening with the court. I do get some information on the process, so I make sure I can let creators know as much as possible about what, uh, what I can tell them. Um, well, I'm trying to make sure uh, people like Brock uh, don't take advantage of creators by trying to sell them dreams and they, I mean, I don't know Brock's full intentions yet, so I cannot say for sure, uh, but based on the number of lies, um, the way he's been acting, I don't think there's anything good for creators going with Brock. Yeah, something quite interesting with the creditors mm. as well. I mean, I haven't spoken to many of them directly, but I did read the entire AMA. 
Mm. And what was quite interesting is there was little to no ill will or anger towards you in that. And I don't know if this is time, like over time people just become a bit more relaxed, or if people become a little bit more, I don't know, they, they're now judging 2014 with a fairer eye. Do you still get any kind of ill will towards you or do you, are you tending to find that people are actually, actually being kind of okay with you? Well, actually, uh, I, I think time actually helped a lot in, well, helping people to heal and start to take some distance from everything that happened at the time. Uh, one of the creators were very, very angry at me, uh, even sent me at the time a message about how he would kill and cook my cat. Okay. And actually he contacted me and said, I'm so sorry, I don't want to hurt your cat anymore. I'm, I'm sorry about the food. I replied to him, yeah, it's okay, I know you were angry, I mean. <laughs> and he like sent me, oh, thank you very much for forgiving me. And I mean, people who act at the time were obviously under a very, a uh, lot of, well, stress and it was a difficult situation for everyone. So I can understand people would be angry and say things they don't actually mean uh, at the time. So many of the people who just contacted me uh, either needed help, so I put them in touch with people who could help, or I introduced them lawyers in Japan explaining how to file claims, um, what were the deadlines. Even today when someone like recently uh, posted on Twitter, like it's too late to file a claim, I tell them, yeah, maybe you can still, I mean, the trustee has said they can still accept claims. So I tell them to just file and see what happens because if they don't file anyway, nothing will happen anyway. So that's basically what I'm trying to do today. Um, I've got, well, compared to what I got in terms of messages at the time, I got a lot, much better feedback from people now. So tell me what's going to happen over the next coming mm. kind of weeks and months and how does this all close out, Mark? Well, uh, right now the next step would be uh, the creators choosing a civil rehabilitation plan, which uh, basically is going to say uh, or define how the civil rehabilitation will proceed with the distribution and the end of life of Monvox. Um, well, there's no way to say for sure yet what plans will be submitted because the deadline is not passed yet. The deadline is in uh, April 24th or 26th, I don't remember exactly. Uh, but starting that time, I understand creators have been working together with the trustee to get a uh, kind of master plan that would make sure everyone is happy. Um, all creators get as many bitcoins as soon as possible. One well, the different kind of things that could happen that would make this more difficult. Uh, one thing is I don't know if any other creators are planning to file plans. And actually, not only creators, anyone can file a plan. So it's possible uh, a sponsor out there will appear and just file a plan. That's so unlikely because in order to get the plan approved, you need to get the creator's vote, which means you need to communicate with the creators and uh, have a good image with the creators. So that's... One thing we don't know yet. Um, there's another issue with this is even if the plan is approved, uh, the status of CoinLab and their $16 billion uh, claim could mean that we need to wait uh, until this is solved to move forward with any kind of a distribution. Because if CoinLab's claim is approved, then they need to receive $16 billion, which would mean all creditors get nothing. Uh, so, the way the court does is, even if the coin up claim is obviously meritless, they still need a final decision on this. So they cannot just say, uh, yes, we know coin up is not a claim we need to care about. We just do this. This is not something the court can say. They need everything to be, uh, well, on black or white. Okay. Let's try and think uh, mm. five years forward now. Let's hope that's all over. Mm. Let's hope the coin lab yeah. uh, law case, uh, lawsuit is dropped. Let's hope all the creditors have received their distribution back. Kind of where, where do you want to be in five years' time? What do you want to be doing? What's going to be coming like next year? Well, for me personally, I don't think I'm going to be involved in uh, cryptocurrencies anymore. Okay. I've had enough of this <laughs> uh, what kind of business. 
Uh, but there's still many things I like to do. And I mean, I've got, well, I can code and build things. Um, I'm working right now at a new company, London Trust Media, uh, building new things and working on new, well, new businesses for the future. Uh, London Trust Media, I mean, we're a company, we work on protecting people's privacies. So we're not that different from what Bitcoins do, uh, but it's slightly different ways of uh, going uh, to it. Okay, you got any final comments, anything you wanna say before we close out? Oh, uh, yes, I can very, I hope very much that CoinLab and Peter Business will just stop their claim. Um, well, I, some, well, uh, once again, I'll say to everyone who was involved with Mongols that I'm very sorry the way things went. Um, I very much wish I could just go back and fix things so Mongols doesn't just go the way it went. But well, there's only so much I can do, so I'll just continue helping and making sure everyone gets as much help as they can and the bankruptcy sees the distribution as soon as possible. Okay, well listen, appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you for yeah. this. Thank you very much. Thank you.